morning, everybody. Good morning. I want to invite you to come on in if you want to stand as we open with worship this morning. Dearly Father, we just come before you this morning, and Lord, we just confess our great need for you, Lord. So we just come to worship you, to lift you up, and Lord, we just lay our mornings, we lay our weeks at your feet, Lord, and just ask that you would come and wash over us, Lord. Lord, that you would be um, truly the focus of our hearts and our eyes this morning, Lord, that we would look to you. And, Lord, that we wouldn't just sing songs with empty words, Lord, but that we would truly lift you up and worship you this morning, Lord, because you alone are worthy of our praise. So we give you this time. We lift you up in Jesus' name. Amen.
with more of you and less of us, Jesus. We need you, Lord. Yo 
we ask that you would have your way in us, Lord. You know those things that we need to lay at your feet, those things that we hold on so tightly and try to do ourselves, Lord. Lord, let us lay our lives before you. We belong to you. You are our King. You are our God. You are our Lord. And we worship you this morning.
worship you and we thank you so much Lord that you came to this earth so that we could be freed from our shame Lord free from our sin free from condemnation because of the great sacrifice that you made Lord so Lord we fix our eyes on you this season and we thank you Lord for your goodness for your mercy and for your grace Lord Lord, have your way in us. Lord, show us those things that you want to make more like you and less like the world around us, Lord. And just help us to have hearts that are willing to listen and willing to obey you, Lord. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, go ahead and take this time and say hello to someone sitting near you.
morning, church. Hope everyone's doing okay today. Hey, Linda. So if I could ask everyone to slowly take your seats. Well, we could start anytime you want. So. Okay. Um, so, um, so we're about to do announcements. Um, I, I, I think I mentioned this before. I have a, it's not a difficult job. I, I just have to come up here and read a few things off of a piece of paper for you guys. Uh, but there's, there's always these little extra things that people will remind me of, and I always forget them. Um, so I'm going to, I have a note here, I'm going to take care of it right off the top here so I do not forget it. Uh, and that is, uh, we had the women's um, um, uh, Christmas breakfast uh, yesterday, I believe it was. Um, they have a, uh, and we have a lot of extra decorations left over from that event. Um, so if anyone is interested or in need uh, of decorations, there is a table outside in the hall there on your way out, um, uh, so please just stop by. Okay, um, so first off, we're, we're getting pretty close to Christmas here. Uh, next week is our Christmas Eve service. It happens to actually uh, fall on a Sunday, uh, so uh, next week that's going to be uh, uh, our Christmas Eve service. So also just, just keep in mind, and as we mostly know, that Christmas Eve tends to be a uh, our Christmas holiday as well as Easter tends to be a little busier time of year. You know, people that aren't necessarily willing uh, to go to church on a regular basis seem to be more willing on uh, those holidays. Uh, so it might be a good time that if you know someone that doesn't normally attend, uh, ask. Uh, you know, and it might be a good opportunity to, uh, to bring someone with you to church. Um, uh, snow. We usually hit this one early. We kind of hit, got a little late on here. We've been fortunate up to this point. We haven't had much snow this winter, um, but um, unfortunately, that's probably not going to last. And actually, th this this Sunday was uh, uh, first time we actually did have to, s to deal with some ice outside. So um, before we set up on Sunday, we do have a, a, a group of people that um, we need to actually go around and clear the pathways, whether it just be shoveling snow if it actually snowed or spreading out the ice melt to, to, to melt the ice that is there. So that way when people get here, it's the conditions aren't as dangerous as they should be. We need volunteers for that. Um, you know, I think today it was just uh, Mike um, who would, uh, who's, who's on the team that was helping out. We do need additional help. So it's not something that, you know, it, it happens every Sunday, you know, but when it does happen and we do get, you know, it snows on Saturday or something like that, we do need a couple guys to show up a little early um, to, to really kind of clear that up. Um, so, um, you know, if, you, if you're not currently uh, helping out in the morning and you, you have the ability to do so, uh, we have a sign-up sheet on the sign-up table, so just uh, please uh, take a look at that. Um, of course, we have our midweek service, which uh, we talk about each week. We just finished Chapter 9, uh, so 70 weeks. Uh, so we're moving on to Chapter 10. So uh, if you haven't already, uh, please join us. It, it is more than just a Bible study. Uh, uh, and it is interactive. It's not, uh, Mike isn't up there preaching a sermon. It's, 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 just, it's like a big, large, dysfunctional Bible study is, is pretty much what it is. Um, but we also, we have, we have a meal there, so we'll have a time of fellowship and food, and uh, it's, it's just a really good time. And you really get to know people a little better uh, on Wednesdays because it's, it's more personal, it's smaller, and uh, it's a lot more time for fellowship than you would on a Sunday. So I encourage you, if you're not already going, uh, think about visiting that one. Um, Philippines, uh, as last week we showed a video, uh, we talked about that, um, that the trip is, is coming up, it's going to happen, I mentioned your both in the specific dates at the end of uh, February and the beginning of March there. Um, but if we have anyone, and if you want any information on that, we have a table set up for that. Also, if anyone's uh, able and willing to help out with that, uh, wants, wants to contribute financially, uh, you can go see um, uh, David and Eve Guth out at the, uh, the table for that in the hallway. Um, oh, men's breakfast and potluck. Uh, last month we had, we kind of broke schedule a little bit. We canceled men's breakfast. Uh, I don't know if we even had potluck last month. I don't remember it was a different one, but uh, we are doing them both this month. Okay, so men's breakfast is still happening last Saturday. 
uh, in that week between uh, Christmas and New Year's, and um, as is potluck. Uh, so uh, just be aware and ready for those. Um, and I think that was all the items I had. One, one other thing, um, most of you guys probably are already aware of this, um, but uh, about a week ago, um, um, we uh, had an unexpected loss of uh, my wife's mother. And, um, you know, and uh, as you imagine, it was, it was you know, it was, it's been a tough time, a tough week. Uh, but I just wanted to, to comment on the amount of love we have received uh, from this church body. Um, and just the, whether it be the, the phone calls, the, the cards, the flowers, the, you know, the meals that people have brought over to our home. Um, and, you know, we, we had uh, uh, during... Um, pre-service announcements, uh, one of the verses that was up on the screen was uh, from John. Uh, and it said, by this, um, all, will know, uh, um, all will know that you're my disciples, uh, and it's uh, by the love uh, that you have for each other, right? And I just want to let you know my wife and I, my family, has felt that love, uh, and I, th I thank you very much for it. Um, so... Uh, let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to, to gather here today, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this church, this church body. Um, we appreciate it so much, Lord. Um, now, Lord, help us to be a, a church that lifts each other up, a church that loves each other, Lord, a church that picks each other up as we're down. Um, and Lord, we, we ask, Lord, that uh, as we get ready to go into your word, Lord, we ask that you join us here. We ask that you are over this service. We ask that you guide Mike and that you speak through him, Lord, uh, and prepare our hearts to, to receive him, Lord. We thank you and we pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's get realistic now here. Okay. Yeah, I stopped in front of the speaker, by the way, because I don't know if you hear. It seems like there's somebody else invading our speakers. I don't know if we're picking up on something. So, anyway, don't run. It's going to be okay. Um, yeah, and that verse that uh, Darren shared, that was also the verse that Linda taught on at the women's Christmas lunch. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. And I just want you to know, uh, there's a lot of people who have misconceptions of what makes a great church. You know, by this, they'll know if you have great programs, great children's ministry, great youth group, if you get great perfect doctrine, you, there's all kinds of things that people emphasize. But what Jesus emphasized was love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and love your neighbors yourself. And the, these are the two greatest commandments. And upon these two commandments, all the other commandments rest. That was Jesus' priority. Let's keep Jesus' priority. And I think we're doing it. So my hat's off to you. I don't have a hat on, but hey, I, I'm grateful for a warm and loving church. So thank you for you. Um, if you would, why don't you turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're actually just going to focus on one verse today. But I do, uh, you know, it just dawned on me. I have it in my notes and I almost skipped it. I have um, uh, one more announcement to let you parents of high schoolers know that there's a change coming. We're going back to plan A. Uh, my vision and my plan has always been to begin to integrate as the children grow up, begin to let them know that they're a part of us. It's not just, you know, each age group has to be kept separate. As a matter of fact, somebody was asking me before service today uh, for Christmas, are we going to have let the kids in? Well, by the way, we always are allowing the kids in. Okay, if you want your whole family to sit together in church, that's great. I don't fight that at all, as long as they're not blowing whistles and beating drums and doing crazy stuff, okay? Just keep them under control. It's like Chuck used to say, Chuck Smith used to say that crying babies are like New Year's resolutions. They should always be carried out. So I always like that. Anyway, uh, I, I, my philosophy on family is family should not be rejected. To, you know, you don't force all these special interest groups. And, but sometimes the parents just go, 
Thank you for having a children's ministry so I could just come in here and not worry about anything, just worship God and pay attention to the word. I understand. It's just, we'll leave that up to you. Back to what I was saying earlier is I think that one of our goals should be as a church, as the children grow up and turn into adults, they need to begin to realize that they're part of us, not just they graduate high school, and now what special group is there for them? Oh, well, they might as well leave the church. No, I want the high school kids to know that they are part of the church. So uh, we're moving back to my plan A uh, as of next week, and I want you high school, the parents of high schoolers to know that we're going to have the, the high schoolers in here, and we're going to have growth groups and midweek activities and stuff like that, because I think there should be activities and things for the high school kids. Uh, and I've told you before, when I was a high school pastor, I used to tell my kids, if you don't want to be here, don't come. Because if you come and you're being forced to come, uh, and I tell your parents, Pastor Mike said you don't have to come to church. I used to say that to the kids because otherwise, kids who are coming and they don't want to be there, they're practicing having a hard heart to the Word of God. They're practicing closing their ears to the Holy Spirit. They're there, but they really don't want to be, so they're texting, they're doing this, they're passing notes, whatever. Back when I was a high school pastor, they weren't texting yet. <laughs> they were sending up smoke signals back then. You know. <laughs> so my hope and dream is to see the kids as they grow up to learn to integrate and to be a part of us. And so you parents, feel free if you want your in, encourage your high school student to sit with you or sit with the others, but keep an eye out to make sure they're not in mischief. You know, um, of course, we have a security team for that. They got the handcuffs already. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I just think it's important that they learn to, to study the Word of God and to seek the Lord and to worship God and not just be stuck to their devices. You know what I mean? So we're going to... Is it coming from the speaker? Yeah. Okay. Well, we, if worst comes to worst, we'll turn the speakers off and I'll just... Yell! People, I've been accused of having a big mouth before. So, Well, hopefully you've all turned to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 by now. And we're only going to cover verse 9. It's funny, some of you are thinking, uh, if you come from a more traditional church, well, it's Advent season. Why are we doing these other texts rather than Advent texts? You know, this is where we happen to be in our journey through the Bible. But I also think we're getting ready to study next week the greatest spiritual gift of all time. The greatest gift of all. It's Jesus. You know, thank God for his indescribable gift. I almost couldn't say that. And so we're, why not look at God's gifts to us as the church, and then we'll, we'll jump right into a Christmas message next week. Now, if you were with us last week, you realize I was going to cover four gifts at one time, and, and matter of fact, the, the message up there, the title said, Faith, Wisdom, no, Knowledge, Wisdom, Faith, and Healing, and I only got halfway through, but that's okay. I want to be open to the Holy Spirit. I think it's okay when you don't finish your notes. When the Lord says, stop right here, tell this story, I want you to do that, because you know what? That's how God works. You might have this plan, and God says, no, do that. And so I want to model for you being flexible to the Holy Spirit because there's times God wants to do something in your life you didn't plan on doing. Or he'll tell you to stop and not to do what you did plan on doing. So it's just, it, you never know, okay? So a, a quick review on last week, we looked at the word of knowledge and word of wisdom. And as most of you saw, if you were here, I've had a lot of experience in encounters with the word of knowledge. Uh, of, of, of all the spiritual gifts, that's probably been at least close to the top, where I've seen the word of knowledge, where God's given somebody knowledge or given me knowledge it, while witnessing. And remember, one of the ways that God will use the spiritual gifts most is while you're seeking to serve him, while you're walking with him, when you're walking in the spirit. If you want to see the spiritual gifts active in your life, serve the Lord with your life. Get involved ministering. Some of my stories were I was witnessing at Balboa Park in San Diego, and as I'm witnessing, the Lord gave me a word about the person I was witnessing to. Sometimes I'm going door to door, and the Lord gives me a word. When you're serving God, that's when he gives you gifts to serve him. Why would he give you a gift to serve him if you're not planning on serving him, right? Some people go, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. Well, 
start serving the Lord. And, uh, you know, whether it's volunteering for Sunday school or whatever, you'll find out if you're gifted to teach or not. Nope, that ain't it. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and, and so um, just be open to what God has for you during this season and during this series because obviously after Christmas and after New Year's, we're going to get right back into it. Father, we open our hearts to you. We just pray, Lord, show us what your gifts are for us. Show us how you want to use us. I pray, Lord God, especially for those who don't know what their gifts or callings are, that as we seek you, as we go through your word, you make very clear our spiritual gifts because we want to be used by you, Lord. We want to be vessels unto honor for our, our king. And so, Lord, may we be what we were created to be. May we become what we are born again for. And so, Lord, as we study this, these next two gifts, uh, speak clearly and speak personally to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are in 1 Corinthians, we're going to just be looking at uh, verse 9 today. But I'd like to give you something to think about before we start getting into these two gifts. Is I would like to say, I think it's highly likely that most of you are already moving in your gifts and maybe you don't even know it. There's times the Lord's using you. I've heard people in other churches that don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. And, and, and you know, we don't believe in those spiritual gifts. And then those very same people would say, say something like, you know, while I was praying the other day, I felt like the Lord was saying to me, well, hello? You just don't call it spiritual gifts. You just don't call it word of knowledge, word of wisdom. You just say, the Lord was saying to me, that's fine. But I'm saying, usually, if you are a born-again Christian and love Jesus, it's very highly likely you're already using your spiritual gifts, and you just may not recognize it. You know, let me just ask this. What do you find yourself doing when, when you encounter somebody in need. Uh, some of you, right away, you're ready to, to give to them or, or, or to, to um, you know, maybe help pay a bill or whatever. A, you may have the gift of giving. We're not going to cover that this series, but you may have. That may be your special gift. So, some of you just go, well, let me help you with that. I, I know I've been through that before. Let me help you with that. And you have the gift of helps, okay? And you would never, you, and you're going, blah, 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 I don't know what my gift is, but you're doing it, okay? So maybe pay attention. Maybe kind of open your eyes and realize what you've been doing. Some of you guys, as soon as somebody needs help with something, you're there to give them counsel, and you're there to give them prayer, and you may have spiritual gifts of encouragement or exhortation. It just goes on and on, okay? Let me tell you one more quick story that I didn't tell you last Sunday is that you did hear that we've lost our daughter recently, and, and it, was, it was horrifying. It was tragic. You know, it, how many weeks? Ten weeks ago? It was almost 12 weeks. I stopped adding after a while, okay? But um, during that time, you know, we saw spiritual gifts active in the body as people rose up, whether it's giving or making a meal or in encouragement or prayer. And, and one gal who Linda hasn't heard from in a long, long time uh, called her. It was a gal who actually used to go to church here and has moved on. And she called Linda. She goes, what's going on in your life? I can't shake the idea that the Lord just keeps putting you on my heart. What's going on in your life? Are you okay? And, and in, as soon as Linda, of course, she broke down crying and just told her. And then the gal came by and brought food and just kind of hung, hung with us. It's like, that is a spiritual gift. If you ever have somebody just on your mind, you can't shake it. Don't, don't shake it. Maybe the Lord's trying to put something on your heart and, and, you know, be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. You may not think you have a spiritual gift and the Lord's going, Hello? I'm telling you something, okay? <clears throat> so don't brush it off when you get those hunches. Follow up on it. Someone's on your heart, on your mind, give them a call. Drop by their house. The Lord may be saying <clears throat> they need some love right now. They need encouragement or, or whatever, okay? And, and so you don't necessarily have to. In the old days, we used to have these prayer lines in some of our services in, in the early Calvary Chapel days. If you want your spiritual gifts, we have the elders and the pastors up front, and you come forward and they lay hands on you and pray over you. Eh, that, that can happen. You see it in the New Testament, and you've, we've seen it in church history. But you know what? It doesn't take an anointed person with laying out of hands for you to have your spiritual gift. It just takes you yielding to the Holy Spirit, loving Jesus, and saying, Use me, Lord. 
and, and he, he will use you, okay? So it's naturally supernatural. And I don't want you to get the wrong impression that <clears throat> after service, you need me to lay hands on you, you know? If I'll blow on you. And then, you know, people do all kinds of weird stuff. You don't, you don't need that, okay? You just need Jesus, <clears throat> and you need the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, the Holy Spirit, I would remind you, we talked about this before, gives out spiritual gifts as he wills, to whom he wills, that's in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, that says, but one and the same spirit works all of these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. <clears throat> one of the things I'm going to emphasize as we go through this series is that you don't get to pick which gift you have. You don't have to go to school to learn how to do You know, there were some churches that used to have what they call the school of the prophets. You go to the school and you learn how to be a prophet. It's like, yeah, be careful. You could get out of orbit. You could do weird stuff with, with the spiritual gifts. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, it's the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that gives each of these gifts, works all of these things, distributing to each one individually. That means, by the way, each one. That means if you're a Christian, you've got one. We just, Or you might have more than one spiritual gift. And it's all according to how God decides who gets what. It's not if you're really a good boy, we'll give you prophecy, you know. If you're extra spiritual, you get to be the pastor. Believe me, that's not true, <laughs> okay. It, it's all up to the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now, in verses 8 through 11 in this chapter, Paul gives a list of nine spiritual gifts. And so we're not going to give go through a list of all the gifts, but I'd remind you, we have uh, this list out on the table, and I, as I'm looking at it, I'm realizing I need to update this and maybe fine-tune some of the definitions, but uh, it's a start, okay? Uh, here, we, we've got uh, A through Y. What is that, 25? X, Y, Z. Yeah, tw 25 spiritual gifts listed here, taken from the scriptures. If you want to do a little study on your own or with your small group, you could pick up a, a, a sheet in the... Uh, on the table in the hallway. And so there's more lists in chapter 12 of Romans and in Ephesians chapter 4. But this is the longest list of all the actual lists in the scripture. And I'd remind you again, I told you last week, that I don't think every spiritual gift is on some list somewhere. There's, you know, God's not in a box. He could do anything through anyone at any time. He's God. It's not like, well, that's not on the list. Well, you know, I, I don't know. I've had people ask me, is this a spiritual gift? This is what the Lord's do, using me for. Well, there's a variety of ways God works, and I don't know if we ever could find that on the list, but you just keep serving the Lord and keep, keep letting them use you, okay? Uh, now, another thing is I told you some stories last week about some pretty spectacular spiritual gifts that I've experienced. And, um, you know, sometimes as we look at any of these stories, some of you might ask, well, how come... God healed that person, but God didn't heal this person. Or how come God spoke a word of knowledge or word of wisdom through that person, and I've never got it? Or, or they, they didn't speak to this person over here. And the answer is, I don't know. I don't know. It's up to God. It's not up to me, and I don't have all the answers, okay? But again, let's start now, and we'll, we'll flow from verse 8 into verse 9, where we're going to do most of our study today. Uh, back at 1 Corinthians 12, 8, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. Those are the two gifts we looked at last week. Verse 9, To another faith by the same Spirit, to another healings by the same Spirit. And so well, the first thing I'm emphasizing, you can see by the bolding in the text behind me, is that it's the same Holy Spirit doing all this, Okay. Some people have this mistake. They go, I've got the spirit of this, and I've got the spirit of that. Well, if it's the spirit of, then it's not the spirit of God. The spirit of God is the same Holy Spirit that does all these things. Uh, don't start saying, i got the spirit of this and the spirit of that. You may have a spiritual gift of wisdom or knowledge or healing and so on, but it's the same Holy Spirit working all of these things. Now, let's look at the gift of faith in verse 9. It says, to another, faith by the same spirit. Now, I want to clarify right up front that this gift of faith is not the saving faith that we talk about when we talk about people get saved by, uh, by grace through faith. Uh, it's a different kind of faith. But let me, let me lay that foundation first, that the, the, the faith, basic 
faith by which someone gets saved is, um, you know, we get saved by grace through faith. Let me give you a couple of verses on that. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, great text. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. What righteousness of God? You can get the righteousness of God. You can become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5.21. I'm not going there yet, okay? But you can become the righteousness of God. How? Keep reading. This is being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith. Folks, I just want you to know the only way anybody is righteous before God is through faith. Now, of course, as we walk with him, hopefully our behavior and our lifestyle and our actions follow up and, and we begin to look a bit righteous as well. But it's not, certainly not by you going, well, I'm going to be righteous and I, I, I'm going to do this and not do that and do that. You don't get righteous on your own. It's the righteousness of God imputed to you as you put your trust in Jesus Christ. So it's the righteousness of God through faith. That's why bold and, and capitalized through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. What's the prerequisite? Just believe in God and you will receive the righteousness. So this is one kind of faith. Okay, there's a different kind of faith we're going to talk about in a moment. Um, by the way, I did a search. Sometimes it's fun with technology. We could open up our Bible software and type in a phrase. And I typed in through faith and said, just tell me how many times through faith is found in the New Testament. And I found, at least in the, um, i trying to think which translation I used, probably the New King James of this one, it was 17 times the Bible used through faith in relationship to salvation through faith, okay? And this was one of them, Romans 3.21. Let me give you two more, and we're going to move on here. Uh, the, the, another one, great one, is Galatians 3.26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. How do you get saved? How do you become a child of God? Through faith, okay? It's simple, by believing in God, by trusting God, as Abraham modeled for us as well. Uh, one more, Ephesians 2.8. Now, I'm not going to read. I love to quote 8, 9, and 10, but I'm just going to give you 2.8, okay? For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, okay? Which, by the way, a lot of people make the emphasis the gift of God is faith, I think the gift of God is salvation, and, and grace describes it, and through faith describes the, the venue, the avenue, that it's through trusting God, and so let's get that straight as a foundation, that when we talk about the gift of faith, we're not talking about saving faith, because saving faith, the call goes out, and whoever believes will be saved, okay? But then there's this gift of faith. And let me read you some definitions from some different sources. Um, recently, I've added to my collection the Fire Study Bible. Let me read you what the Fire Study Bible says about the gift of faith. This is not referring to saving faith by which a person first accepts Christ and turns his or her life over to him. This is a special, supernatural, or exceptional faith that enables a Christian to believe God for extraordinary, miraculous things it is a faith that moves mountains. That's from 1 Corinthians 13.2. It is often found in combination with other spiritual gifts and is expressed, uh, excuse me, gifts and expressions such as healings and miracles. Now, we're going to see that as we look at the gift of faith because there's times someone's got a gift, but they wouldn't use it unless God gives them faith with it. You know, like for instance, if you've got the gift of prophecy. And there's people, I've been in meetings where somebody says, oh, my children, they speak in the name of the Lord, speaking to his people. That always freaks me out, because you better be right. Uh, I really shied away from that prophetic gift, because it takes faith. You better believe God is speaking through you before you say, oh, my children, thus saith the Lord. Really? It better be the Lord speaking. And so I'm very careful with that one, because it takes the gift of faith just to go, Okay, God, I believe this is you. and you. Speak. Otherwise, it's the gift of presumption if it's not the gift of faith, okay? So I like uh, the fire study Bible explanation. Now, your first fill-in, for those of you in the small groups using your fill-ins, is faith. The gift of faith is the special endowment that God gives the certain members of the body of Christ to believe with extraordinary confidence the will and purpose of God for his work. Now, um, 
Some of these I changed after I had them printed. And so does it say believe with extraordinary confidence in your notes? If not, change it to believe with extraordinary confidence. Okay. Now, there's, uh, I like to give you scriptural examples. I like to give you personal examples. I think one of the first times uh, as a young man I, ex I experienced the gift of faith. And again, I'll remind you, just because you've experienced the gift of faith doesn't mean it's a permanent thing. Like, now, Mike Sasso has the gift of faith. Well, God gives it to you when you get it, and sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't. I don't always go around doing extraordinary things and extraordinary miracles. S same with the gift of healing. Because somebody has, has been used by God to bring healing to someone, doesn't mean now they could go into a hospital and clear it whenever they want. A gift is something God controls when you use it and who uses it and who you use it on, okay? Sounds like a victim, who you use it on. Be careful who's next, okay? Um, so, uh, personal example, I remember when I was just out of high school, and uh, my friends were always trying to hook me up, you know, and the, I went on this double date, and there was this gal I, I was dating, and you know what, honestly, when I was just out of high school, I was just looking for God's will, and I was very careful with women, I wasn't, I wasn't after the wrong things, if you know what I'm talking about, and so this gal, I would try to witness to her, and um, <clears throat> her sister in a short period of time, I knew her. Her sister came down with spinal meningitis. And if you're familiar with that, that's very dangerous, very deadly disease. And she's going, oh, please. And she knew I was Christian. Go, please pray for my sister. She's got spinal meningitis. And the word is out. And, you know, and so I said, I will. And, and I began to pray. And as I began to pray, the Lord showed me she's going to be healed. And they didn't expect. They thought, they thought the worst was coming. And I got so excited. I mean, it was... The gift of faith is you get excited because you know, you know that you know. It's not, you know, there's times I've prayed for people and I hope that I hope, you know. But I prayed and it's like, whoa, God says I'm going to heal her. And so I, I wrote, an, I went over to the, her, her door and knocked on her door to tell her that she wasn't home. So I wrote a note saying, hey, I'm so excited. God is get, God told me he's going to heal your sister. It's going to be okay. And I wrote the whole thing and I stuck it on her door. She's blown away. Because she got that note and that she got news from the doctor that her sister was just, all of a sudden, she's better. And, you know, that, that's what the gift of faith looks like, okay? <clears throat> um, I, let's see, there's a couple of other stories. Oh, yeah, next page. I'm thinking, I thought I put a list down here. Um, I heard, there's a story about Chuck Smith. I think it was kind of fun and funny because I heard a story. Now, I wasn't there, but I heard it secondhand, so... Forgive me if you, you were there firsthand and you, uh, I'm messing something up, but I had heard that there was a time when Chuck Smith was having a service in the early, early days, and his kids were young, and his kids uh, had this guy in a wheelchair and wheeled him up to the front for, for prayer. And Chuck Smith felt like the Lord just gave him the gift of faith, and he prayed and pulled the guy out of the wheelchair, and he was walking, and everybody was like crying and wailing. It was just like it blew them away. This guy is healed. And the, the, the kids who brought him up says, Dad, we just brought him up because he had a cold. <laughs> you know, God can do the unexpected. And, and so yeah, then I've heard, I heard then, of course, as you would expect, all of a sudden the next service, all the wheelchairs are showing up, Right. And they're saying, Dad, how come you're not doing that again? All these people coming forward for prayer in wheelchairs. And he says, God just gave me faith to do that. And he's not giving me faith to do it now. So you know what? Before you pull anybody out of a wheelchair, make sure you're hearing from the Lord. But I think that's a great story. It's powerful, but it also has a little chuckle to it. Because God can give you faith. And when he gives you faith, you step out in faith. If he's not giving you faith to do something, don't do it just because you read it in the Bible. It could be disastrous, okay? So uh, let's look at some scriptural examples of the gift of faith. Uh, there was a storm at sea in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 27, and, and the, the, the crew had given up all hope, and an angel appears to Paul. Let me just read it. There stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore take heed, excuse me, take heart, men. This is Paul speaking, telling the story to the men. Take heart, men, for I believe God 
it will be just as it was told me. Now, if somebody told you, or of course maybe if an angel appears, it's a little easier to believe, but I think this is a, a glimpse of the, of the gift of faith because Paul believed God. By the way, I think that's what the gift of faith is. It's believing God. It's not just thinking you can do whatever you want to do, by the way. There are some people run off of that. If you have faith, you can do whatever you want. Well, I think you need to stay in tune with the Holy Spirit and believe God. So Paul believed God. Now, another story is Peter in the book of Acts. Early in Acts, in Acts chapter 3, uh, he sees this crippled beggar on the side of the road. And it says in Acts 3, 6, Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the guy who's walking and leaping and praising God, if you know the story. Now, in most cases, for me, I would just drop in a couple bucks. Silver and gold have I none. I'd say, here, have a dollar, you know. But this was special. This takes a gift of faith that God says, no, no, no. He wants money, but I want to heal him. And so be open to the gift of faith. If God moves on your heart, don't brush it off. Don't go, no, no, that's, that was the pizza I ate. That was, you know, you kind of push it off or something else. Be open. The Lord wants, I believe that the Lord wants to move in the spiritual gifts in the church today much more than we're seeing the gifts because we brush off the voice of God. We explain it away and we just chuck it and say, no, that can't be God. You know what? There's one way to find out. You go, but what if I'm wrong? You know what? Just listen. And there's been times I've really prayed in faith over somebody, and I've seen people get healed. And there's been other times I'm not sure if God's telling me, but I'm going to pray in faith anyway. And if they don't get healed, that's, that's God's reputation on the line, not mine. Okay? I'm not going to worry. I'm going to believe God. Okay? So anyway, uh, again, remember the, the Fire Study Bible says, it's a special, supernatural, or exceptional faith that enables a Christian to believe God for extraordinary and miraculous things. It is a faith that moves mountains. It's often found in combination with other spiritual gifts, expressions such as healings and miracles. And so we'll see that as we move on today. Uh, Paul and Lystra. He's, um, he's, he's doing the work of the Lord in Lystra. It says in verse uh, Acts 14.8, 14, and in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. That takes faith, huh? And this man heard Paul speaking, and Paul, observing him intently, seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped, he leapt, and walked. Now here, this brings a whole other aspect. Some people make it all about faith. If you have faith, you can be, anybody can be healed. If you don't have faith, you can't be healed. Well, there, faith does have something to do with it. And so here, there's several gifts of the Spirit in, in operation here. Uh, first of all, Paul, seeing that this man had faith to be healed. He had a word of knowledge. He had some kind of insight, spiritual insight. How do you see faith? How do you look at something and go, ah, oh, I can see you got faith. It was a gift, another spiritual gift working here along with the gift of healing, and he saw that this man had faith to be healed. I have to tell you, I can't brush off the idea that God wants us to believe him for healing. And so there is something to do with faith, but, but there's more than just, uh, it's, if you don't have faith, you can't be healed. If you have faith, it's not just faith, okay? So let's, let's uh, your next fill-in, by the way, is the gift of faith Often, and I'll, I, there's one that needed to be changed. Not always, but the gift of faith often. So cross out always and write in often. Works in combination with other spiritual gifts. And we're going to look at that. Uh, here's what David Gusek says about the gift of faith. He says, though faith is an essential part of every Christian life, the gift of faith is the unique ability to trust God against all circumstances, as Peter did when he walked out of the boat, onto the water. You know that story, right? That took the gift of faith. Of course, it seems like he lost it real quick. But, uh, you know, it, it takes faith to do something against all odds, against normal reasoning, okay? And that's what the gift of faith looks like. And so I'm not asking you to be crazy. I'm not saying, well, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and just start believing God and doing crazy things. I'm not saying that. Jesus, excuse me, Peter stepped out of the boat because Jesus told him to. 
Oh, well, he did ask for it. He says, if, if it's really you, Lord, call me. Well, Jesus called him. Come, Peter, walk on the water. If Jesus didn't say come, I would not have stepped out of the boat, would you? Have you ever been on a boat and just thought about that? Oh, I wonder what it would be like to walk on water. Wait till you get some skis or something, and you could try it, okay? So Gusek goes on to say, Another mighty example of the gifts of faith was the Christian leader and philanthropist George Mueller, who in the ninth century, England, provided for thousands of orphans completely by prayer without ever asking for donations. <coughs> now, here's the thing. Uh, I've seen people do this in, I, in, in other ministries. I'm going, let people know you have a need. If, if people know, you can give. Well, that's not the way the Lord directed George Mueller. He just thought if God wants this to happen, he's going to provide, and he just prayed. And God, you know, there's food left on the doorstep, money left when he least expected it. George Mueller had the gift of faith. I don't think you could live like that, like George Mueller, unless you have that gift. So I have seen people mistakenly go, well, this is the way I'm going to do my ministry. Well, make sure that God's directing you to do your ministry like that. Like, for instance, we have never taken an offering. It's because I really feel like in the beginning, when we first started Calvary Eagle, that God instructed us and made clear. We got a little offering box in the back, in case you missed it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and, and we've never taken an offering. We never ask for money. And the Lord always takes care of and covers the bills. I love it. That's exciting to me. You know, people, I get emails all the time uh, on marketing techniques of how to get your people to give. I delete them. How, how do you get your people to give? We'll, to help, hire us, and we'll show you how to get, get money out of people. You know what? I like what we're doing. I like the way we're doing it. That we don't ask, and the Lord provides. So that's where we're at right now. I wouldn't say I have an exceptional gift. I think that's just the, what, what the Lord's doing. Okay, our, our time is ticking here, so we got like 15 minutes to go over one more gift. It's the gift of healing in the second part of verse 9. It says, to another faith, but the second part says, to another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Now, the gifts of healing, let me read a definition for you, is the special endowment of God that God gives to certain members of the body of Christ to serve as human liaisons through whom it pleases God to cure illness, to restore health, apart from the use of natural means. Now, I'd say apart from the youth, use of natural means means if you're a nurse or a doctor or a medical professional, praise the Lord, we're grateful for you. Uh, that's, you're, you're trained in that, but that's not necessarily the gift of healing. The gift of healing would be a miraculous healing, okay? Um, now, later in this chapter, excuse me, <coughs> Somebody told me today the inversion is doing that to me. I don't know. Sometimes I think it's just old man voice. Huh? All right, youngins, listen up to me. You know. <clears throat> All right. I used to have a young man voice, but that's changing. Okay. Um, later in this same chapter, Paul's going to mention the gift of healing again, only this time it seems like he's listing it in a list of rank, ranked gifts, and he ranks it only fifth on the list of spiritual gifts just above helps. You think, oh, I wish I had, all I have is the gift of help. I wish I had the gift of healing. Well, look at the 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and Paul's giving a list, and it sounds like it's in rank of priority. God has appointed these in the church. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. After that, you see that? After that, miracles. So you could see what God says is most important. Then, gifts of healings, helps, administrations, tongues. You get the idea? Tongues is low on the list of importance. Um, and, and healings is important, but don't think it's all about, you know, I mean, some people go chasing faith healers and go from one church to the next, a big event, they want to see the, the, the show. You know what? Uh, the apostles and prophets are on the top of the list, and teachers. I think that means the Word of God should be a priority in our life. <clears throat> because from the apostles, we got the Word of God. Uh, there's prophetic words in the Word of God, and there's teachers that teach the Word of God. So don't, don't downplay the importance of studying your Bible. Some people, it's all about this gift or that gift. Oh, I know a person who died and went to heaven. Or I know a person who has this spiritual gift, and they want to go hear all these people. 
There are such things, some of them. Some of them I think it's suspicious or shady. But you can always trust the Word of God. And you need to test all things by the Word of God. Now, the book of Acts is full of examples of how God has healed individuals as the gospel spread. So I don't know where to begin. I mean, we could start with Jesus, go through the whole book of Acts. There's healing after healing. So I'm not going to give you a big, long list. But healing is so evident, and it's, it's almost commonplace as you read the New Testament, right? So uh, Adam Clark said, speaking of the gifts of healings, that the power which at particular times the apostles received from the Holy Spirit to cure diseases, a power which was not always resident in them. Pay attention here. For Paul could not cure Timothy, nor remove his own thorn in the flesh, because it was given only on extraordinary occasions through perhaps more generally, excuse me, though perhaps more generally uh, than many others. So it was common, <coughs> but it wasn't, healing was not one of those things that whenever the apostles wanted, they could heal anybody at any time whenever they wanted to. It's God's gifting in us. God gives you a gift, and it's up to God how to use it. Now, some criticize, well, if, if the gifts of healing are true, and if they're for today, why don't people just walk into the hospital? If you've got the gift of healing, why don't you go into the hospital and clear it out? Well, because it's the very thing I'm describing because it's up to God, and, and even the apostles couldn't heal everybody every time. Even Jesus, there were some people he didn't heal. Do you know that? And th that brings me to your next fill-in. Your next fill-in is we can't control spiritual gifts or dictate to God who, uses, who to use them on, right? You don't control it, and you don't tell God. Okay, God, oh boy, there's some people who tell God what to do. Have you seen those kind of, God? I command you to keep your word. Stand back. Here comes the lightning bolt. You don't dictate. You don't command. You don't control. It's up to God. The example that was quoted by Adam Clark was the thorn in the flesh by Paul. Let me read you that one. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, excuse me, chapter 12, verse 7. Paul is writing about his experiences and his revelations and his shortcomings, his handicaps. <coughs> So in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, he says, Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. By the way, that's one of the reasons God makes you walk with a limp or makes you have handicaps so that you wouldn't be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I love this text because Paul is asking God to heal him of something. And God says, no, nah, no, my grace is sufficient. And so Paul's conclusion is, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, boy, can you come to this conclusion? Listen to Paul. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's part. I know there's been times I'm on the way to church in the morning and I'm just feeling empty. Or I'm sick. Or something's wrong. Something's going on. And I, when Linda and I pray on the way into church, I'm, I usually pray something along these lines when, in those situations. Lord, I'm really sick today, and I don't feel like going to church, but I, so I know you're going to do something special. Because you, when I am weak, you are strong. And so I say, Lord, be strong in my weaknesses. And I, I count on that. I think that's a principle to keep in mind. Let me give you your next fill-in. God sometimes has greater purposes in using sickness in our lives. Sometimes it's simply a result of living in a fallen world. Okay, there's, there's two things presented in this fill-in. There's times when I'm sick and, and I want to get better, and God says, my grace is sufficient. I've got you weak for a reason because I'm going to be strong in your weakness. There's other times we're weak or we're sick just because we live in a fallen world and there's germs going around, okay? Now, 
Paul wrote to Timothy, interesting, along these lines. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Timothy had frequent infirmities. Timothy seemed to have a, some stomach problems. And instead of saying, Timothy, you just need to have more faith. If you had more faith, you wouldn't be sick. He didn't do that. Instead of saying, Timothy, next time I'm in town, I'm going to lay hands on you, and you ain't going to be sick no more. See, that's how some people think. You know what Paul says? The water is bad where you live. Drink a little wine instead of water. The water, stay away from the water. And for your stomach's sake, uh, the wine in your area the, comes from the grapes in your area. And the, you know, I just think be, do, you do better if you just have a little wine to take care of your stomach. Uh, translation, medicine. <laughs> Sometimes we could use a little medicine. That's what Paul told Timothy. Instead of, well, don't have enough faith or you need me to pray for you. Okay, pay attention here. All right, another thing is Tromephus. Uh, Paul couldn't heal Tromephus. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20, uh, Paul is writing to, to Timothy. He says, you know, Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Tromephus I have left in Miletus sick. But Paul, you know Paul's done healings, right? But here's this brother Tromephus that he says, you know, I, I, I tell you where everybody's at. Erastus is in Corinth, but Tromephus... He's too sick to travel, and I had to leave him behind in Miletus. Well, that doesn't sound like people of faith. He never once mentions because, you know, uh, Tromephus was in sin. He never mentions that it's because he didn't have enough faith or I didn't have enough faith. It just happens to be sometimes Christians get sick, and you don't always have an answer why. Sometimes... Sickness can be because of sin. Sometimes, but not always. Let me give you an example. Uh, we, we've been in 1 Corinthians 11 the last couple of weeks, and Paul is talking about, uh, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. 29, he says, talking about eating the communion with a wrong attitude in an unworthy manner. He who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, slow down, like unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Paul actually said, because some of you going to church and you're doing potlucks, and we already taught, uh, covered all that. He's saying you get the wrong heart, the wrong attitude. You're doing a holy thing in an unholy way, and some of you are sick because of it. So there are times, and we know from other examples, I'm not going to go on and on. There are times that people are sick because they're in sin. There are other times where Jesus would say, Neither because he sinned or his parents sinned that he was born this way, you know? So you can go on and on with that, all right, um, sometimes. Now, let me, I want to take a poll. How many of you guys have ever experienced divine healing? Either you were healed or the Lord used you to pray for somebody else and they were healed. Raise it up high. Okay, the, we see hands up, but not as much as when we covered the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, right? So healing doesn't seem as active. Now, sometimes it could be because of other factors. Like I said, spiritual gifts, sometimes we need to step out and do it. Um, but I could tell you something. There's been times where the Lord has healed me. <clears throat> it's funny. I'm struggling with my voice today. But one of the times the Lord healed me was in my voice is that um, I would, on a regular basis, <clears throat> around Christmas time, hmm, I would lose my voice completely when I lived in California, and I'd have to go for like a month talking like this, you know, and, and it would be like a regular thing, a laryngitis, and my annual, oh, there's Pastor Mike with his annual laryngitis, you know, and, uh, you know, you go to the doctors, and they tell you the best thing you could do is don't talk. How do you tell a pastor not to talk, <laughs> let alone an Italian, okay? <clears throat> and so they say, don't, don't use your voice, it'll heal faster. Well, I had just started coming down with this laryngitis Christmas time. I thought, oh, great. And we were having a communion service, and uh, I was serving communion with a bunch of other pastors, and I just thought, you know, I don't care. Don't talk. I'm going to worship God. And, and I began to worship like this. Oh, praise God from whom all blessings fall. You know, it was bad. 
and I'm serving the communion, and I'm singing out. And as I began to worship the Lord during that communion service, my voice started coming back. And by the end of the worship time, I'm like, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Hey, look, it's happening now. Um, but I'm telling you, I mean, I, my eyes were like this big. And, and I'm talking to other pastors who knew I couldn't talk before the service. I'm going, hey, listen to me. Hello? Notice anything different? And I think it was just that the Lord just graced me during the communion service while I'm worshiping him, and, and I experienced healing. Uh, there's been other times, I know when I was a young man, I had a hernia, and I was like doubled over, and I went to the doctor. He goes, oh, I don't know if we need to do surgery or not. We'll just keep an eye on it, and you get a hernia. And I had some friends of mine pray for me, and thank God I didn't have to have surgery. I just, okay. And now, can I tell you a really detailed uh, and show you the doctor's report? I didn't think about keeping the doctor's report, but I know the Lord touched me, okay? Uh, I know another time where... Um, before I moved to Cali before I moved from California to Idaho, I had a very bad neck problem, and it was so bad, pinched nerve, that I was losing the strength in this arm. It was atrophying so much. If I took my shirt off, you could actually see this arm was different. This arm was all withered. This arm was all buffed. I actually did work out back then. Um, but I mean, I used to be, I used to do push-ups and all kinds of exercise, and it's like I couldn't. I, uh, I was like. And they knew, the doctors thought, well, we need, to, we need to do some surgery. So this was major. They wanted to, you know what they do is they cut in from the front side of your neck, pull up the vocal cord, put it in a cadaver bone, and fuse uh, your vertebrae together between six and seven. It's starting to sound real exciting. I wish I would have had it. <clears throat> and, um, and I'd have prayer, and I was in pain, and it was, it was very painful, long, long story. And I was scheduled to go in for surgery, in the morning, they let me go home. They did all the pre-op beforehand, and they gave me a little wristband. They checked me in. They says, if you want, you could sleep in your own bed tonight, and I did. I laid in bed, and I, because of I was going to have surgery, I, I got off all my pain pills, and I'm laying there going, I'm trying to make it hurt, you know? And I roll over and go, Linda, what? Go to sleep. You need, you're having surgery in the morning. I don't think so. <laughs> Mike, don't do this. You don't know how hard we, we fought to get this surgery before we move. I go, but what if, what if I'm healed? Don't do this to me. Cause, cause she, she, she thought I was just having mind games, you know. We went, got up and I called, I called on the phone. Says, what if I get out of the surgery? It's so much story to that. I went down to the hospital and I'm doing push-ups out in the parking lot, going, trying to make it hurt so I could justify surgery. I am not going to let them do all that I just described to you if I'm getting better. If I'm, and I didn't, not, honestly, I don't know looking back, it was just God's timing that he was, my body was healing itself. Or it was like a natural, cause, but it was just the day before surgery. And to the point to where I told the nurse as I was checking in, how long do I have for surgery if I want to wait on this and they says three months I says I'll see you in three months and I went out in the parking lot and I'm doing my push-ups and trying to trying to make it hurt so I could go and and the doctor comes out in the scrubs Mr. Sasso yeah are you sure you want to back out of this yeah okay because we got somebody else waiting as uh, in the line for a backup if there's an opening and we're, we're going to take him instead I said and I never went back. I never went back. So, you know, listen to the Lord. <clears throat> and I'm not saying, if you have to have surgery, don't do it. I'm just, you know what? I, I, you know, we had so many people praying, and I really felt like, you know, I can't justify doing this if the, the Lord's in the process of healing me right now, right? And so, you know, I, I got stories. I know y'all got stories. As a matter of fact, I asked for a show of hands. Hands went up a divine healing. Uh, I'm looking at the clock. I actually went over already, but let me just finish, okay, because I'm not going to make this a three-parter, okay? James gave us a general rule of thumb uh, for dealing with sickness. In, in James chapter 5, verse 14, he says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith 
will save the sick. You notice he says the prayer of faith. We need to pray believing. We need to pray in faith. I, I got a long story behind this, but the Lord's taught me that when I pray for somebody, <clears throat> I've heard pastors pray, oh God, this person has cancer or whatever. I know sometimes you don't heal. Oh God, I know that maybe you may not heal this person. I want to say to that pastor, shut up and get out of the way. God, I know that you can heal. And I know that you can heal cancer. And I'm going to pray believing. I believe we need to pray believing or, or we're just wimps. If you're going to pray for somebody, pray for crying out loud, pray believing. Okay, excuse me. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, it will be forgiven him. Stop. Sometimes sickness can be as a result of sin. But God can heal and cure that. God knows a remedy for that too, okay? Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. There's all kinds of principles in here, and I'm rushing along now because our time is up. But faith has factors in it. Sometimes sin, let me give you your last fill-in so you don't have a blank in, the, in that part of your notes. Sometimes sickness is the result of sin in our lives. Sometimes it's the result of Adam's sin. Sometimes because of the fall of man that there's sickness in the world and it's not always your sin. Just like every bad thing that happens, sometimes it's because you did something bad. Sometimes it's because somebody else did something bad to me. Okay, so sometimes it's Adam's sin. And so <clears throat> it's not our job to judge. Oh, I tell you what, we've gotten cards before from people who are in the word faith movement. When my wife, I've told you before, when my wife had a miscarriage when we were much younger, and we had friends who were in the word faith movement and sent my wife a card. It's too bad people can't just believe God. And it, you know, it's kind of like, I don't remember the exact wording, but it basically, instead of a sympathy card, it was, <clears throat> if you would have just had faith, this would have happened. You wouldn't have lost the baby. It's not our job to judge like that. There's all kinds of factors, and you don't know them all. Only God knows them all. <clears throat> now, one more scripture, and then we're going to end. Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. I want to end with this because there's an important principle in here. Uh, Paul wrote to the Philippians, he said, Yet I consider it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all, he was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick almost unto death. But God had mercy on him. And not for us only, but also, not for him only, but also me. Let me the point I want to end on, God had mercy on me. When I pray for people to be well, I use that word a lot. Mercy. God have mercy. Because the reason why God healed Epaphroditus, according to Paul, wasn't, he was sick unto death, but I had faith. He was sick unto death because of his sin. You know, all the things people would put in there, Paul said, God had mercy. Oh, don't you count on the mercy of God. Don't you count on the grace of God. It's not because, well, I have faith or I didn't... It's God had mercy. And when you pray for people who are sick, follow my example. I pray, God have mercy. God have mercy on so-and-so. That's how I pray because that's how Paul prayed. And that's how what Paul attributed Epaphroditus' healing to. So remember, we can't control the spiritual gifts. We can't dictate to God who gets them. All we can do is call in the name of the Lord and offer ourselves as living sacrifices and say, Lord, use me. Gift me that I might bless me that I might bless others so our time is up we're going to close right here but let's pray and I want to ask you as we call the worship team up if you have this heart and attitude maybe you're saying God I want the spiritual gifts active in my life just make it a prayer unto the Lord and I'm going to do something else special while we're closing in this last song <clears throat> if you need healing today we want to pray for you Hey, we're talking about healing. Let's, let's pray. And so if you need healing today, I'm going to ask that you stand to your feet as we worship. And I'm going to ask that those of you who have the faith to pray, 
I'm not asking for a miracle from me. I'm not asking anything special. I'm asking that you step out in faith and that if you know how to pray and you get faith, the go lay hands of those who would stand up because those who are standing are standing saying, I need a touch from the Lord today. I need healing. So let's worship the Lord. And if you need healing, stand to your feet. And if you, could, if you could pray, go lay hands. Thank you, Father. Holy God. People are beginning to stand, so pay attention. Thank you, Father. Holy God. Father. sure nobody's standing without a prayer partner. Pay attention. Search my heart me clean Jesus. Holy God. I long for my Is there anyone else? It's not too late. If you need prayer, stand up. We're paying attention. We want to not neglect anybody's prayer need. You need healing. It's not too late. Stand to your feet. <clears throat> Holy God, have mercy on your people, Lord God. We need your touch. We need your love. We need your healing. We need your mercy, Lord God. Father, some need physical healing, obvious to all. Others not so obvious. Some are broken spiritually, broken emotionally, and need your touch of healing. Raise up and heal, Lord God. Have mercy. Do what only you could do in our lives, Lord God. Have mercy on your people. We look to you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Lord. Holy is your name, Lord. We trust you. We trust you. We look to you. We long for your touch. We long for your healing. Holy God. Let's all stand and let's sing this song one more time through. Holy God. Jesus. Jesus.